Most large language models we use today, like Gemini, Claude, and GPT-5, are transformer-based models. Even though the transformer model was announced back in 2017, GPT-based models didn't really gain mainstream adoption until around 2022 with the release of ChatGPT. So as you can see, we had nearly five years of scaling and experimenting until the GPT architecture rose to where it is today. And similar to GPT-based models, we're starting to see diffusion-based models enter into mainstream adoption as well. And diffusion-based models started from image generation tasks, it is now emerging into language space directly competing with transformer-based architecture as well. For example, in May 2025, Google released Gemini Diffusion with a speed of more than a thousand tokens per second. So as the industry is undergoing some massive architectural shift, I thought it was a good time to review how we got to diffusion models and where it is today to catch ourselves up. Two years prior to the release of transformer research architecture, a different type of model was introduced called diffusion models. While transformer architecture was initially intended for language translation tasks that got adapted into more general tasks that we use today, the diffusion model was also mainly geared towards image generation tasks. And now the underlying technology is also being applied for general tasks, just like the transformer based model. So let's rewind a little bit to understand how we got here to fully grasp the landscape of diffusion models. One of the biggest challenges in AI was training a model to understand images. While languages have grammatic structure and seemingly obvious patterns to learn from, images were totally different game and notoriously been a difficult task. In 1987, a new concept called autoencoder started to emerge from a research paper that laid the groundwork for how neural networks can internally represent images. The core idea behind autoencoder was to essentially compress the data like a zip file, but store them in a lower dimension, later called latent representation. And just like zip files, you can reconstruct the data from the latent space. Although their main focus was on dimensionality reduction and for unsupervised learning in a general sense, what autoencoders essentially proved is that we can train a neural network to learn the key features of images and demonstrate it in a lower dimensions. And your question here might be, okay, great. You have a model that takes in a perfectly fine image and then reconstruct it into the same image. What can we do with this? While it might seem a little bit pointless to convert an original image and then having to reconstruct it in the same way, the implication that a neural network learned features of images and how that can be applied was huge. For example, if you have an image that was partially damaged you can essentially train a model to reconstruct it by restoring the damaged part. And from here, autoencoder exploded into other applications like facial recognition, neural inpainting, data compression, and most importantly, image generation. One critical application was generative tasks, meaning generating new images that are original, in other words, novel data. However, the limitation of autoencoder model was that it wasn't capable of generating new images because it was deterministic. In other words, similar to how when you zip your files and unzip it, you're going to get the same file all the time. And autoencoders behave very similarly where the latent representation of the image didn't allow for unzipping in a way that was different each time. In 2013, a new concept emerged where you added the word variational in front of autoencoder, so variational autoencoder or VAE. Variational autoencoder had a very interesting way to essentially zip the image that allowed for new original images to be generated. Instead of zipping the image in a deterministic way, like in the case of autoencoder, variational autoencoder forced variations of the same image by storing the internal representation of the image in terms of probability distribution. So instead of compressing the data as is, variational autoencoder represented the input in mean and variance, also known as latent Gaussian distribution. So what this means is that every time you draw a sample to generate an image, you get a slightly different output. And this paved the way for autoencoder to now evolve into generative models. But this didn't come without limitations. The images generated often led to blurry outputs because the output tended toward averaging out the details instead of producing a crisp and clear image. But given its limitations, it was still a very impressive capability because it learned the key features of the image that matters and gave the model the ability to create variations of the original work in a somewhat novel way. In 2014, so just a year after variational autoencoder, another concept emerged called GAN, or Generative Adversarial Network. Unlike autoencoders, Generative adversarial network only focused on constructing outputs from latent space. So the question was, how do I train a model to create the best of something from nothing 
Rather than in variational autoencoder, the question was, how do I preserve the key features and generate variations of that? The idea for GAN was simple. It involved a simple game between two models, one model that generates counterfeit images and the other model discriminating if the model was real or fake. And by simulating a game between these two models, the hypothesis was that it will eventually converge where both models will be so good that it generates realistic images just as well as detecting counterfeit images. And the outcome reflected its ingenious idea. Generative adversarial network became state-of-the-art very fast and different variations started to emerge based on the architecture like deep convolutional GANs to leverage convolutional layer for higher quality images, style GAN for creating photorealistic outputs, and so many more variations like that. And if you remember popular apps like FaceApp in 2017, where you can use AI to modify pictures and also the website This Person Does Not Exist, start to capture mainstream attention that were all based on the generative adversarial network architecture. But the inherent problem with GAN was that training was very unstable. What I mean by that is that pitting the generative model and the discriminative model was hard to manage. For example, if the discriminative model was too good, the gradients would vanish because every generated image by the generative model was instantly flagged as counterfeit, and the same instability worked vice versa. And this phenomenon is called mode collapse, which was common in training GAN. While attempts were being made to address this very problem, we needed a much better architecture. And while all of this was going on, in 2015, a research paper was released called Deep Unsupervised Learning Using Non-Equilibrium Thermodynamics. With this paper, a new concept emerged in AI called the diffusion model. So, so far, we have autoencoder that compresses the image, variational autoencoder that creates variations of the original image, generative adversarial network that creates the best fake image it can, now a diffusion model that proposed a completely different way of generating new images. The inspiration behind diffusion model was how particles naturally spread out from regions of high concentration to low concentration until everything reaches equilibrium. So unlike the generative adversarial network where two models are learning from each other, the diffusion model used probabilistic physics by essentially taking an image and adding entropy gradually and teaching the model to reverse it back. And your question here, just like earlier, might be this. Okay, we have yet another model that takes in an image and reverts it back to an original. What's really the use case for this? The magic behind the diffusion model isn't just about reconstruction, it's about generation. Once you train diffusion models to reverse noise into coherent images, you can practically start from any pure noise instead of pre-existing pictures. This means you can not only generate completely original data, but also generate an extremely high quality image like we see in more mature system like Stable Diffusion and DALI. While conceptually, this seems very interesting, it failed to gain mainstream adoption when it just came out in 2015, mainly because of timing and less mature architecture. The original concept proposed by Diffusion Model required a lot of computing compared to generative adversarial network. Back then, common GPUs were NVIDIA's GTX 980 and Tesla K80, which only delivered around 5 to 9 teraflops with less than 12 gigabytes of memory. By today's standard of NVIDIA's H100, which was released in 2022, it delivers hundreds of teraflops with over 80 gigabytes of high bandwidth memory. So the diffusion model somewhat sat on the shelf to be explored more until both hardware caught up to where it needed to be and also an improved training method was proposed in 2020 with a concept called DDPM or denoising diffusion probabilistic models. Since then, we have seen a massive explosion in adopting diffusion-based models where in 2021, OpenAI's researchers released a paper called Diffusion Models Beat GANs on Image Synthesis, followed by the release of DALI 2 in 2022, and Stable Diffusion, ImageGen, as well as seminal research papers that introduced improved variance schedule, more stable training, requiring less and less computational requirements. And since then, the industry didn't just stop at image generation. In 2022, a bold exploration was made to introduce diffusion or text generation called Diffusion LM. And while changing the medium from image to text seems like an easier jump than going from text to images, this was not the case for diffusion models because of the chaotic nature of its architecture. And this is all because as noise gets added to an image, the image will still relatively hold shape to what it was. For example, going from the color blue to slightly less blue is still blue. In other words, the data that holds images are continuous by nature. But for languages, if you take the word, let's say cat, and add a random noise and it becomes chat, the word now semantically means something completely different, which is why diffusion models don't translate to text as easily. And Diffusion LM proposed, instead of using tokens, we can use the embedding, which should be continuous and decode them back into text. So now that we have broad understanding of how diffusion models got to where it is today, and we anticipate for how diffusion models could take shape in the future, we can fully appreciate how the industry is maturing into a model that could change how we get things done using AI.